Well, worry. I think we all worry. I don't know anyone who hasn't worried. We worry about all kinds of stuff. We worry about COVID. We worry about our jobs. We worry about our finances. We worry about our children. We worry about the decisions they're making. We worry about their futures. We worry about what their lives are going to look like. Someone did a study one time, and they estimated that the average parent worries about their children 37 hours a week. That's a full-time job. Now, I know some of you are thinking, I, especially the dads, are like, I worry for like an hour a week. Right. So if you're at an hour and the average is 37, your poor wife, she's carrying the balance. You know, we, we worry about all kinds of things. We worry about getting old. We worry about our finances. We worry about our marriage. We worry about retirement. Worry is part of of our lives, and it doesn't seem as if we can extract ourselves from it. But Jesus speaks right to worry. If you were with us last week, you remember Pastor Andy gave a great message. Uh, the, the preceding verses that we're about to read where Jesus talks about not building up treasure on earth, but building up treasure in heaven. So Jesus' next words, we're, we're about to read is in essence, Jesus continuing. He's saying, so don't worry uh, about all this stuff, worry about God's kingdom. Invest in God's kingdom. Build up treasure on earth. Uh, if you build up treasure on earth, it will be lost. But if you build up treasure in heaven, it will be eternal. If you do that, then Jesus says this, if you do that, therefore, I tell you, you do not need to worry about your life. Everyone say, do not worry. It's not a suggestion. It's not a nifty idea. It's a command. Jesus commands us, do not worry. Who obeys Jesus? Well, I'm glad some of you do. I'm glad some of you are honest and say, I don't. I mean, I sit here in church and pretend I do, but I really don't know. Jesus wants us to obey him, and he's telling us, you do not need to worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you're, uh, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Isn't that what I just read? All right. Um, about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. So Jesus is saying to us, you do not need to worry about these things. Don't, don't worry about them. He, he is telling us, you have to get to the point where you set aside worry and you walk in faith. So Jesus' whole point, his, his clarion call when it comes to worry is simple. Do not worry. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. That sounds great. I'd love not to worry, but you don't understand. I can't turn that part of my mind off. It's like breathing. It's like my heartbeat I'd love not to worry. I'd love to do what Jesus said. I'd love to obey him, but I can't. You know, when it comes to sin, we'd never do that, right? Like, I'd love to stop living in lust and greed and giving into temptation and God's, but I just can't. Well, that's true and it's not true. You just can't, but the Holy Spirit in you can. You have to decide, I want to overcome this. You're right, you can't overcome sin on your own. You can't overcome worry on your own. But the same Holy Spirit active inside of you that can help you overcome sin in your life can help you overcome worry. Now, Jesus is not saying you should never feel worry. The emotion and the moment, oh, I'm worried about something. That's being human. You're going to feel worry. Jesus is saying you don't need to live worrying. You don't need to live in this constant, perpetual state of worry. So what does it mean to worry? Here, here it is. Worry is thinking over and over about negative possibilities, believing they will happen. Over and over. Oh, my gosh. I know at some point we're going to lose all our money. I just know it's going to happen. We're going to be homeless and, and destitute. I just know at some point... One of my children, something bad's going to happen to them. They're going to get a disease. They're going to be in an accident. Uh, so their, their, their life is going to go off there. I know something bad's going 
going to happen. I just know it. I know it. I don't know exactly what it is, but it could be this and it could be that. And we believe not only that it might happen, we convince ourselves that it will happen. We just think about it over and over and over. And Jesus is telling you and telling me, I don't want you to live like that. What's the value in living like that? See, we worry about the negative things. Who worries about positive things? Oh, I'm so concerned my kids are going to be successful. Oh, gosh. What will I do if they have a lot of friends and they're well-liked? No, we worry that they're going to fail. We worry that they're going to be ostracized. I don't know anybody who's ever come to me. And if, if this is you, please come to me. I've got some great advice. But no one's ever come to me and said, I'm so worried I have more money that I know what to do with. I've got, it. I've got some thoughts for you. I've got so much money, I don't know if I can ever retire. No, People say, I don't know if I have enough money to retire. I don't know if I'll be able to pay my bills. So we worry about these negative things, and Jesus is saying, stop doing that. In Greek, the original language that the New Testament, most of the New Testament was written in, the word worry has at the root the idea of something being pulled apart. And in English, we get worry from an old, Greek, uh, an old German word. That means to strangle or to choke. So when Jesus tells us, do not worry, you don't need to live in this perpetual state of worry. What he's telling us is this, do not allow yourself to be pulled apart because of worry. It will choke the joy out of life. It will, it will begin to, uh, to cause you to not be able to have joy connect with people, a full life, a rich life. It constricts everything down. Something's going to happen, and therefore you can't live life fully. It's kind of, worry is like living life carrying around a skunk. It makes life stink. But here's the thing. We pick up this thing called worry, this skunk of worry. We know the best thing to do is put it down. It's making my life stink. It's making my life miserable. And yet, there's part of us that clings to it. We hold on to worry because we don't know how to deal with it. And Jesus says, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. I have a better way for you to live. And he's telling us, do not worry. He gives us three reasons why we shouldn't live life perpetually worried. So this is what he says. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The obvious answer is no. No, I, I can't add an hour to my life. I can't add a hair to my head unless I have Bosley hair replacement. I can't um, add inches to my height. There's nothing I can do. When I worry, worry produces nothing, helps nothing, uh, finances nothing. Worry doesn't do anything that's positive. So Jesus is saying, do not do not worry. Why? Because worrying makes nothing better, nothing better, nothing better. What worry does is makes things worse. Worry amplifies things, right? We have an issue, an everyday issue in life. Um, here's one. You ask your child to go, who's got their driver's license now, grown, uh, teenage, young adult, and you ask them to go to the store for you. From the moment they pick up the keys, heart's racing, anxiety, oh, they're going to die. I know they're going to, I should never ask them to go get milk. Well, that's not making life better. And so we agonize over these things. It makes life worse takes an every ordinary day event and it, it amplifies it to the point where when we are dealing with legitimate situations that require uh, constructive, insightful uh, solutions, we're paralyzed to even make them because we're scared if I make this decision, if it's the wrong decision, all these bad things are going to happen. So worry doesn't make things better, it makes things worse. Physically, it affects the, the circulatory system, it affects our breathing, it affects the nervous system, it affects the glandular system. Relationship, emotionally, uh, worry causes us to be disconnected from people. Listen, I have never heard of someone who died because their life was stress-free. Oh, that person was so free of stress, they died. 
but I've heard of people who have died from stress and anxiety and worry. Worry never produces anything. So Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. Worry doesn't make anything better. Then he goes on and says this. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. Let's see. God looks at you. He looks at me and he says, you are created in my image. You are my children. You are my sons and you, my, you are my daughters. I made you to be in relationship with me. Of all of creation, you are my crowning achievement. You are the most important. Everything that we see, you realize this. Everything God created, he created for us to enjoy. He says, I did all of this for you because I love you. Don't you think I'll take care of you? So don't worry. Jesus says, don't worry, because first of all, worry doesn't accomplish anything. It makes nothing better. The second thing is this. He says, don't worry. God cares about you personally. Don't worry, because God cares about you personally. God is not a distant, capricious, mean, distant, uncaring deity. He knows you. He cares about you. Other verses talk about he numbers the hairs on our head. He knows everything about us. Anything that's bringing you worry, God knows about. He cares about. He cares deeply about. He says, I know this is a concern for you. I want to deal with it. I want to help you. Look at, look at all creation. Jesus says, look at all of creation. Look at the birds. Look at the grass. Look at the flowers. If I care for them like this, how much more will I care for you? And yet so often we say God doesn't care, God doesn't know. When we say God doesn't care, what we're saying is I don't believe God cares about me. He might care about other people. He doesn't care about me, but God cares so, so very much about you personally, what you're going through, the situations you're going through, the, the, the relationships that are good or bad or struggling. He cares about your finances. He cares about the food in your cupboard. He cares about the job that you're looking for. He cares about the home that you're trying to establish. He cares about all those things. And because he cares and he cares about you personally, why are you worrying? Peter picks up on this. Listen, if you read the, the Sermon on the Mount, just read it over and over and over. I encourage you, always read the Sermon on the Mount and then read the rest of the Bible, the rest of the New Testament especially. Because the rest of the New Testament is basically picking up on the ideas that Jesus taught here. So Peter, later on, who heard Jesus teaching this, says this in 1 Peter. Give all your worries. Don't worry about anything. Do not worry. Give all your worries and cares to God. Why? Because he cares about you. He cares about you. He cares so deeply about you. But when you say God doesn't care about me, you're doubting God's goodness. You're doubting God's character. You're doubting his love for you. Listen, we talk about God's goodness. We sing about God's goodness. We don't understand God's goodness. God's goodness, please hear me. God's goodness does not mean only good things will ever happen to you. If you want that kind of goodness, you need a genie in the bottle. And your heavenly father and my heavenly father is not just a granddaddy who wants to give out gifts all the time. He's the God of all creation. He knows the beginning from the end, the first from the last. And God says, my goodness isn't that I only allow good things into your life. My goodness is the fact that I am always perpetually good. The goodness of God is the fact that he is only ever good. He's only ever. Job if you remember the story of Job, Job had everything, and then he lost just about everything. And his wife scorns him and ridicules him. And he says to her, should we accept good 
from God, the good that God sends away, the blessing, and not expect there to be difficulties in life? God's goodness isn't the simple fact that good is only the thing that happens to us. It's the fact that God is only ever good. It reminds me of something uh, Corey Ten Boom said. She shared a story. If you're not familiar with Corey Ten Boom, she was a, a Dutch woman, a watchmaker, and during World War II, during the, the Nazi invasion of all of uh, the continental European area, uh, Jews and gypsies and, and many Christians were sent to concentration camps. She was made aware of this, and she began to rescue little Jewish kids. She was found out, and, and in the 1940s, she was, as a grown woman, sent to Ravensbrück, which is an infamous uh, Nazi concentration camp. Millions and millions of people died there. And she was sent there, and she suffered for her faith in, in Christ, for her testimony for God, that she stood for life to help people, even at her own peril. And in, her father was arrested as well. Her father died. She's in Ravensbrook, and she's leading people to Christ, telling them about God's goodness. And she's, doesn't, she doesn't die. She's released when um, the concentration camps were uh, released and, and the war was over, and she began to spend her life. She lived into her 80s. She spent the next 30 years or so traveling around the world, telling people about God, telling people about the atrocities that she saw, but the goodness of God, warning people, let's don't ever let this happen again. Then at 85 years old, from the time she was released from Ravensbrook until she was 85, she never had a permanent home. She would just be itinerant. At 85, someone purchased a home for her in California. And there she is, the last years of her life. Someone came to visit her, and they said, Oh, oh, Corey, isn't God so good that he would provide this house for you? Corey Tenboom didn't even hesitate. Her response was this. God was good, even in Ravensbrook. That's the goodness of God. It's not that you have a house. It's not that you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's an aspect of God's goodness, and praise God when you have that stuff. But God is good if you're laying up in a hospital. God is good if a, if a friend, a family member, a spouse dies. God is good if you lose your house, you lose your home, you lose your job, you lose everything. God is still good if you tie God's goodness to everything in your life. And I only have good stuff, so God's good. Well, then if you go through hard times, what's your faith anchored to? And I promise you, you go through hard times. That's why Jesus says, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. God cares about you. God cares about you. And then Jesus says this. He says, oh, you of little faith, or you could Maybe even better translate that, where is your faith? She's saying, look at all of creation. Where's your faith? Where's your trust? Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. When it says the pagans, it's unbelievers. Those who aren't in relationship with God, they need these same things, and they're spending their life chasing after them. But God knows you need them. Where's your faith to believe that God will provide, that God will give? So what Jesus is getting at is this. You don't need to worry because God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. He's worthy of your trust. He's worthy of your faith. He's worthy, He's worthy of you putting your confidence in him and not living in worry. But here's the thing. A lot of us believe wrongly that trusting God is an intellectual um, endeavor, but we don't believe in God intellectually. We believe in him relationally. We trust in him. In other words, trusting God isn't passive, it's active. Trusting God is active. We actively say, God, I'm trusting you. I'm putting you first in everything. That's, that's what Jesus was getting at, what Pastor Andy talked about last week. Don't store up treasure on earth. Actively trust God about treasure in heaven. 
actively trust God. God, I'm going to put you first, your agenda first. I'm going to live in a way that endeavors to honor you, to please you, to reflect the standards and the morals that you've outlined in your word. God, I'm going to live for you first, primarily. And as I actively trust you, it's not my responsibility to get ahead. God, I trust you. I trust you to provide. I trust you in amazing ways. So Jesus, Jesus is, is driving home the fact that we need to get to the point where we don't worry, but we believe, we trust in our Heavenly Father. That he, he knows everything that you need at a personal level. Do you believe that he can give it to you? Or do you think it's your job? That's what it comes down to. Active trust or passive trust? Intellectual trust or relational trust? Do I really believe that God can provide all this stuff? See, what Jesus really wants for you and for me is for us to have a faith that's growing, that's dynamic. Jesus wants your faith to grow. So I want to talk for a few minutes about what it means to trust God. If we're not supposed to worry, but we're supposed to trust, what does that mean? Because Jesus wants a living, dynamic, growing faith. Now, that doesn't mean a faith that believes everything is supposed to be easy peasy, that we're always supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, that there's never going to be difficulties. That's not the kind of faith Jesus is after. Jesus is after the kind of faith that says, even when I don't see a way, I'll trust you to lead. Even when things are unclear, I'll follow you. Even when I'm living in lack, not in abundance, but without, I'll trust you to provide. Even when things are hard, God, I'm going to trust you. A faith that cries out to God and says, I'm scared. God, I'm hurt. I'm confused. I'm, I'm, I'm uncertain. I'm looking at what's going on in my life and I don't see a way out. I don't see any way out, but God, I know you do. And so I will not worry. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust you. Now, here's what's so terrifying about this and so freeing at the same time. In essence, what you're doing is saying, God, I am placing my life in your hands. And that is the scariest thing we can do because we're giving up control. But it is the safest thing we can do because we're trusting God is in control. So that's your choice. You can wrest control from the hand of your heavenly father and do it your way, how you want, why you want, because you think you know better. Or at some point you could say, I will stand in the, in the terrifying safety of God's hand where I have no control, but he has all control. And that's what it comes down to. That's what faith looks like. Faith says, God, I trust you. So if worry is thinking over and over about negative possibilities, negative outcomes, negative results, and believing they'll likely happen, then what's faith? Faith is thinking over and over about God's goodness and believing he will provide. Over and over, God, I know you're good. I know you're faithful. I know you're trustworthy, and I believe you'll provide. I need this job. Please provide. I need strength. I need stamina. I need understanding. I need wisdom. I need a friend. I need help. I need hope. God, I believe, I believe, I believe that you will provide. Now, does that mean nothing bad's ever going to happen to you? No. No. Faith like that, when you begin to pray like that and have faith like that, it doesn't mean nothing bad's ever going to happen. It's like having insurance. Who has homeowner's insurance? Who has car insurance? Everyone better, if you have a car, raise your hand or I'm going to report you right now. Um, <laughs> tired of paying uninsured motorist premiums. No. Um, no. If you have insurance, does that guarantee your house will never have uh, damage, fire, Storm damage? Does having auto insurance guarantee that you'll never be in an accident? Does having life insurance guarantee that you'll never die? I know when you've been paying the premiums for like 50 years, it feels like that. No, what insurance does is it says if something happens, 
you'll be provided for. If something happens, this will help you through. If something happens, you're not alone. Faith in God is the same thing. It's saying, yes, some things are going to happen. Trusting and having faith in God doesn't mean you're never going to get sick. It doesn't mean you're going to be cured of every disease. It doesn't mean any of those things. Jesus could have easily said, don't worry, I'll take all the causes and concerns of worry from you. But he doesn't do that. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he removes those things from our lives that are causing worry. But most of the time he says, I'm not going to remove it from you. I'm going to help you walk through it so that on the other side, your faith grows. So what do we need to worry about? What, you worry. What if I lose my money? What if I lose my life? Well, listen. I've got good news for you. None of us are making it out of life alive. So we're all going to lose our life at some point. And everything that you own or will own at some point will either belong to someone else or end up in the trash bin of humanity. So what's the worst that happens? You die and you lose everything. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. If you say, but my worry isn't about me. My worries about my friends, about my family about my kids. You don't understand. My kids are so sweet and perfect and innocent. If I could just wrap them in bubble wrap. Here's my question for you. Is God bigger than bubble wrap? Is your God able to protect, provide, lead, and guide your children better than you? Is God or bubble wrap where your faith is? You have to answer that. But it's about a trust that says, God, in everything, I will trust you. So I want to invite a couple to come up. They're going to just share uh, real briefly about uh, their, their journey in learning to trust God. And it's an amazing story. So if you would welcome Blaze and Kathleen Maurice. The verse is that we find in Matthew 6 that Justin just preached about impacted my life very deeply when I was single before we were you know, together. Um, I went on a lot of mission trips, but the very first one I went to on, the mission board said, okay, this is how you write a fundraising letter, blah, 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 blah. And I did all they said to do, and I knew that God had put that in to go into ministry. All this decision trip. The money didn't come. And the money didn't come. Right? God was the one. And one, one day it just got down to the bare bones of it. And I was frustrated. <laughs> I went into my room and I started yelling at God. And like a good Christian girl, I took my Bible and I whoosh, threw it across the room. <laughs> it fell onto my bed. Matthew 6. Don't worry. God will provide. Live righteously. Seek first the kingdom of God. And at that point, not knowing what would unfold over the next 14 years, I made a commitment to God. Okay, God, I will stop running around to my brothers and sisters looking for them for money because siblings don't ask siblings for money. They go to dad and ask for mm. money. And so I said, okay, God, I'm putting my faith in you. If you want me in ministry, um, cough up the money. I'll trust in you. <laughs> The money came, mm. but not where I expected it from. And from there, that was just no, trip number one to Russia. It was trip after trip for 14 years, nearly 40 countries, many of which to, I went to repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Mm. I don't know how many times I've crossed the Atlantic, but God was faithful. Never once did I have to go to anybody and say, hey, I really want to go on this. Can you help me raise funds? No, God provided. Mm. And I am so amazed to this day that I look at God and I say, he provided everything I needed. Right. And he built my faith up and it was strong in him. And I was so blessed. At one point, towards the end of those 14 years, this church, somebody here, said, hey, I don't know if it was Wayne or Edwin or who, but said, hey, let's, let's help support her. And then I was blessed and encouraged by this church to continue. But it wasn't just money that God gave. At one point, I was working for a Bible school, and I was, they gave me a stipend of $35 a week. Have you ever lived off of $35 <laughs> a week? It's fun. Well, in the, that time frame, I developed a cavity, no dental insurance. I went to the dentist. They said, you've got cavities. Come back next week. We'll fix it. I was in distress because how do you pay for a dentist bill on $35 a week? <laughs> the night before, 
I was just in my room, stressed. And God, what should I do? Why don't you ask me to heal it? Oh, what a novel idea. Lay a finger on that tooth and, hey, God, please heal my tooth. Amen. Nothing fancy, nothing flowery, showy, nothing. Just God heal my tooth. The next day was amazing. I went to the dentist. And by the end of that dentist appointment, the dentist threw down those utensils and said, she had cavities last week. She has cavities on the x-ray, but there's no cavities in her mouth. Send her (laughs) home and don't charge her. (laughs) And in fact, God provided things I didn't even think I needed because I was going to die a happy old maid in some impoverished nation serving kids. And God said, you need a husband. I didn't think I did, but look, (laughs) God went to the ends of the earth (laughs) and he found just the right one for me. And, And so I received that good gift and that just continued to unfold more steps of faith. And he will tell you about our journey together. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Um, God is good. Amen? Amen. For real. For those who don't know my, my stories, I came here um, in the United States from Republic of Democratic of Congo, uh, which has been with a war. Um, we ran over, I went to Kenya, I lived in Kenya for five years. I didn't have, had no parents, nobody to help me at all. Um, I came here as a refugee, a man. Do you know what refugees mean? Refugees is somebody who has no home, mm-hmm. somebody who has nowhere to go in another way. You have no place. And I'm one of those. When I live in Kenya, And I came here in this blessed land, and some of you guys take for granted, but this is a blessed land. This is a blessed land. You are blessed to be part of this country, to be part of this nation. You don't have to take it for granted because I have been through something. I have been through somewhere in Africa, I seen how life look like. To make my long story short, in Kakuma in Kenya, some of you like uh, Brad, uh, they know where Kakuma in Kenya is. It's a place called nowhere, it's a desert. And uh, here comes uh, this beautiful yeah. woman right here. And uh, she was preaching in an Ethiopian church. And uh, I was sitting there when she was preaching and I was looking, I said, oh, good Lord. <laughs> I, I am gonna pray for this. <laughs> Amen? And Krista was there in Kenya at that moment. I invited them to the Ethiopian restaurant we went there to eat, but I didn't ask anything. In my heart, I saying, God, if it's your will, you will make a way where it seems like there's no way because I know you're a way maker. That was my prayer. And I uh, came to the United States. We have been married for almost 14 years, about two more months to go. We will close 14 years as a couple. And we are blessed with three boys. They are downstairs uh, helping the kids as a kid today. And during this message, as Pastor Justin was preaching this trust in the Lord, it wounded my heart. Amen? And I'm sorry, I'm feeling emotional because it touched my heart. Mm. I was on tear. When I was sitting right there, I was like, God, this is what you do. This is for me. So two years ago, Pastor Justin was preaching about financial breakthrough. Anyone in church who need financial breakthrough, Arana was sitting in the back there, Arana right here, and he laid his hand on everybody who was in here. I don't know if you guys remember. So I lost that phone. I recorded it in my phone when he was preaching about it and when he was praying about it. And I said, God, 
this is for me. I'm grabbing this. I feel it. I'm going to take this. So, we went, my wife and I, we, when we get married, we didn't have a house. And we went ahead and we bought a, we bought a house. And I said, I'm not worried about anything. The God who escaped me from the war in Kenya, in Congo, the same God who is going to take care of this. Mm. We bought a house. And there was a moment I asked Edwin, if you remember well, Mr. Edwin, I did ask Edwin, hey, I, I, I want to buy a house, but how these things work in here? And I told him that, no, he told me to do like 15 years. And I said, no, I don't think, it's, I'm just going to do 30 years. And I will let God provide the rest. Children of God, trusting the Lord, we dedicated that house to God. Within six good years, the house was paid off in full. Wow. Amen. <laughs> so that's God, who God we serve. And he's so good. When you trust him, we don't have to worry about anything. Put everything in him, trust in him, and let him provide whatever you need. He will provide it for you. Mm -hmm. And I know during the journey, you're going to have some circumstances, some mountain move will be on your way. But don't lose hope. Keep trusting the Lord. Yeah. Keep trusting. And uh, I think I'm going to close in prayer. You, you, yeah, he, unless you got something to. I've got more. So yes. I will pray after. Yes. Sir. Yes. All right. Thank you, guys. That was that was awesome. Does that mean if you trust God, you're all going to have your mortgage paid off in six years? It might. It might. God might help you pay it off in three. Why does it have to take six years? Some of you may never pay your mortgage off. The issue isn't that you got your mortgage paid off. The issue is no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I need, I will trust my heavenly Father to provide. So Jesus goes on and says this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, everything that you need, the food, the clothes, the shelter, the companionship, the relationships, the job, everything that you need will be given to you. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's that active trust that we talked about. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, do you want God to provide for you? Do you want to be someone who lives in trust, believing your heavenly father? Then here's what I'm telling you to do. Live rightly, live rightly, and leave the outcome to the Lord. Live rightly. Do what God asks you to do. Live a way that honors him, that up upholds his standards, that puts him first in everything. Put active trust in your life and trust him with the results. God, I trust you. I trust you to provide. I trust you with the results. I'll tithe. I'm putting you first. I'll serve. I'm putting you first. I'll consider others better than myself. I'm putting you first. I will love my enemies and pray for those who spitefully use me. I'm putting you first and I'm trusting you with the results. You may have heard this saying, uh, it's been around for a while and, and I'm not dissing it. It's, it's a perfectly valid saying and this is what it is. Pray as if it depends on God, work as if it depends on you. I've heard that and some variations of that. And again, there's nothing wrong with it, but I... I have a little bit different take on it. And the reason I have a different take is because it emphasizes something a little bit different. So here's my version of that. Pray as if it depends on you. Work as if it depends on God. 
Pray as if it depends on you. It makes prayer urgent. You have a responsibility to pray, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. There should be an urgency in prayer. Bring it to God. Bring it to God. Bring it to God. But it also brings into perspective your work, your effort, your contribution. Yes, live rightly, but the results, God, are dependent on you, not me. See, there are people who do everything right and life seems to go wrong and they go, I guess God's mad at me. God's not mad at you. Trust the results to God. And there's people who seem to do everything wrong and walking in all these blessings. Trust the results to God. Pray with a sense of urgency. It depends on you. But live as if the results depend on God because they do. And it frees you. It frees you from worry. I want to read one last verse. And it says this, do not worry. So now this is Paul writing. Remember I told you all the New Testament is picking up ideas that Jesus taught. So Paul writes to the church in Philippi, do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need. So what does all of this mean? It means that at some point we have to move from carrying the, the burden of worry and saying, God, I'm going to cast my cares upon you. Does it mean you'll never feel worry? No, we will feel worry in our lives. Does it mean that somehow you're just supposed to pretend you don't have anxious thoughts? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that somehow you repress all these things. When, when we just read in Philippians, do not worry about anything, but in prayer, Ask your heavenly father what Jesus is teaching us, what Paul is re, uh, reestablishing and, and telling us is this. Do not repress your worry. Redirect it through prayer. Listen, we're all going to feel worry. We can carry it, carry it, carry it. We can deny it. I'm not worried. I'm never worried about anything. Liar, liar, pants on fire. We all have moments of worry fear, anxiety. Or we could say, God, I have this worry. I have this fear. I have this concern. I have this uncertainty. I have this issue that I'm facing. I have this dilemma that I'm up against, but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to redirect my worry to you through prayer. Don't worry about anything, but ask God and pray about everything. Because here's what I've learned in this is what I want you to remember. Worrying keeps you from praying, but praying keeps you from worrying. When you start worrying, you stop praying. I mean, you might say the words, but are you earnestly praying and trusting God? But when you truly fall on your face saying, God, I've got nothing. I'm a refugee from the Congo who has nothing. I don't even have a job. You give me a wife, now I've got to somehow provide for her. And you buy a house and six years later it's paid for. It's because at some point you fall on your face and you say, God, I can't do this. But you can. At some point you have to stop and say, you are God. I don't need to worry. You are Jehovah Jireh. If you remember the story, Abraham goes to the mountain and he brings his son Isaac as the sacrifice. And God at the last moment stays his hand and provides a lamb. And there Abraham says, you are not just Elohim. You are not just Jehovah. You are Jehovah Jireh. What that means is you're the God who sees and the God who provides. Fast forward 3,000 years. And on that same mount, there's a cross. And there's a man who'd been beaten, bloodied, crucified. God saw you and God saw me. And he provided his son as the ultimate sacrifice. It's a God who sees everything in your life and he provides everything that you need. But at some point you have to say, I will trust you with the outcome. I We'll trust you with the results. So I'm going to ask if you'd stand. I want, us, I want us to sing this song together. You may have heard it. You may not have. We've not done it here before. It's called Jaira. As we sing this song, let it resonate in your heart. I do not need to worry. 
I can trust God with the outcome. God, you are more than enough. You're all that we need. Listen, there's someone right here, right now, who needs to hear this. You matter so very, very much to your heavenly Father. God cares about you. He knows. He knows everything that you need. Listen to me. Jesus doesn't say God will provide all our wants. He doesn't make all our dreams come true. He's not a genie in the bottle and he's not Disney World. But he's a loving, heavenly father who knows what you need and he cares so deeply about you. And you can't even believe it. You think the problem is God's mad at you, that he's the enemy. God's not the enemy, he's the friend. God's not against you, he's for you. God wants to bless you. God wants to pour out so much into your life. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. So someone needs to hear this, God knows. God knows, and you need to simply surrender. I will trust God. No matter what the results, I will not worry. If that's you, if you're joining us online, just click the button that says, I will not worry. I will not worry. If you're here this morning and you say, that's me, I want to see him as Jaira, my provider, my father who knows and sees and provides everything that I need. Right where you are, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Now just begin to pray. You can put your hand on, just begin to pray. God provide. God, I want to trust you. I want to believe that you care about me personally. I don't want to worry. What does worry accomplish? Just begin to ask him. Now, as you're praying, there are some here. You can't see God's provision until you receive his ultimate provision as the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So for some of you here, it starts by taking a step and saying, Jesus, you lived a perfect life, a sin-free life, and yet you died a horrible death, the death that I deserve. And I want to receive new life in Christ so that I can live walking hand in hand, arm in arm with you, my Lord, my God, my heavenly father, Jaira, who is more than enough. So if you would say, I want to place my faith in Christ here this morning, just raise your hand. I want to lead you in a prayer. If you're joining us online, click the button that says, I want to surrender my life to Christ. And now if everyone, whether you've raised your hand to receive Christ or not, if you would repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you now and I lay down my life. I've messed up. I've sinned. I've hurt people. I've hurt myself. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Take away all my sins and make me new. I receive now new life in Christ. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Allow me to live for you, to tell others about you, and to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are part of God's family. If you prayed it and you meant it, it's not the words, it's not just repeating something, but if you meant it in your heart, you're part of God's family. And when we dismiss, please come forward. Let us pray with you, pray for you, and help you take your next steps in this walk with Christ. If you prayed that prayer and you're online, just click the connect with us button so we can help you as well. But now, if everyone one last time would close their eyes, if that was you earlier and you raised your hand and said, I don't want to carry worry anymore. Whatever happens, happens. I'm okay with the outcome, but I will not worry. If that was you, one more time, if you'll just raise your hand, just raise your hand, just hold it high. I'm going to ask Blaze if he would come up here. I want him to pray over you all. Just receive this prayer as God imparting something into your life. And then when we're done, we're going to sing a song, a song called The Blessing. A song that declares he is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Please, in that moment you're in, I just want you to examine, to examine your, yourself. 
as Pastor Jackson mentioned, this message came, it did not come for a reason. It came for a reason. Probably this message just came for you. As touch my heart. I want you to just start touching yourself, start asking yourself, am I worried about anything? Am I worried about anything? And put it into God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, as this song was saying that you are God, you are God, you are God. We call upon your name, God, Jesus. Yes. Yes. God, we invite your presence in here this morning. Yes. You know, God, those who are ready to receive, those who are ready to not worry about anything anymore. God, this is the moment, this is the right time that you touch their heart right now, wherever they are, God. You know who need this, God. God, you are God, you are God, you are God. Yes. Touch your people, Jesus. God, pull up your presence in your church. Yes. God, you say, you say in the book of Matthew that we don't have to worry about anything. God, we don't have to worry even what we will eat tomorrow. We don't even have to worry about what to wear. God, you are provider. You are protector. You are everything that I can imagine. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way in this place. God, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you know somebody who is sick, start speaking favor on that person who is sick. We're going to pray for the sick one right now. And we're going to pray for the, our military in Afghanistan with the issues going on. Please, help her up. Start praying. Start praying. God, Father God, start praying loud. If you need to walk around, don't just shame. We are not just shame. We are not just shame. If you feel like you're going to walk around, walk around. Let's defeat the devil. Father God, we thank you at this moment, God. As God, you pour up your presence, Jesus. We start praying for our military. We start praying for our military. God, that you will provide a safe zone in Afghanistan. You know, God, what they are going through. God, we kneel to you, God. We come before you, Jesus. Help them, God. Help them, Jesus. And for those who are sick, Jesus, God, touch them. Heal the sick ones. Heal, 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 heal in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Now let's, let's declare this together. He is for you.